Texas Forge Trail, and we're headed to Fort Belknap. Fort Belknap is an interesting fort historically, but even more interesting would be the people who were stationed there. Some of them went on to be famous and alter the course of American history. I'll tell you about that later. Once in a while, when we go to one of these forts, I notice a lot of uh, historical markers in the vicinity. And often we stop and look at them to see what it's about. Maybe something happened at the fort or something. This is unbelievable. Uh, I got a copy of it, a picture that I'll post. This is amazing. And it's about someone's grave that's 1.3 miles east of here. This is amazing. sick and they sent him to the hospital where he died. He didn't like the location of this post but after he died he couldn't really fight it so they built the post at a location he didn't like and named it for him. But let's not confuse William G. Belknap with William W. Belknap. William W. Belknap was his son who went on to be Secretary of War and uh, under Grant I think and uh, uh, that's another whole story that you wouldn't believe. But here, Fort Belknap is where a lot of American history was made, or shall we say, the die was cast. Um, there were two people who served at this fort, and, and they were um, uh, McClellan and Marcy, okay? Um, Let's see, William, let's see, nope, 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 nope. Randall B. Marcy and Lieutenant George B. McClellan served together here. Marcy was a captain and an enthusiastic explorer. He blazed a lot of the trails to like Santa Fe and stuff like that. He explored the Canadian River and the Red River, did all kinds of things. The map of the United States might be a little bit different if it wasn't for Randolph Marcy because of some of the stuff he did. He wrote books on the American West and the frontier and what he, what he did here. He wrote a handbook all about um, how to go about traveling west uh, uh, through the frontier and how to deal with Indians, how to find water, how to read smoke signals, how to avoid quicksand, how to not get bit by rattlesnakes. You name it, this book had everything and it became the manual for people migrating from east to west for the 1800s. It was a bestseller. It was just amazing. He wrote all kinds of other things too. And uh, if it wasn't for him blazing trails and doing the things he did, that it, things would have been different in American history. Now, both Marcy and McClellan became major generals and went on to Washington, D.C. McClellan was, like I said, he was Secretary of War and Marcy was his, um, his chief of staff and also his father-in-law because McClellan married Marcy's daughter. And, uh, but McClellan kind of had a falling out with Lincoln and because Marcy kind of hitched his wagon to McClellan, we never hear about McClellan too much, or Marcy. Now McClellan ended up being the uh, 24th governor of New Jersey, so he's not an unsuccessful person, but you don't ever hear about Randolph Marcy and all the things he did in the American West. This is the fort he did it from. And it's an amazing place. We're standing here right now in front of the old commissary. We're going to look at some other buildings at Fort Belknap here in just a second. What? I'm Mark sorry. Sims. Mark Sims here. And he's a longtime resident of, of uh, this county. And uh, in fact, his great-grandfather great -grandfather <clears throat> was the first sheriff of Young County. Second sheriff. Second sheriff. I'm sorry. Second <laughs> sheriff of Young County. Yeah. 
and he has some artifacts that hopefully we're going to get to see here in the museum in a little bit. Uh, can, can you tell us something interesting about this whole thing? I bet you're well, real familiar with it. They kept this fort restored so well uh, over the years since I've uh, been alive, and I'm 63 now. And uh, but I've been coming out here all my life, and uh, it's been a while since I've been out here. But um, you know, they've got the uh, museum just full of artifacts of uh, of Young County. Uh, I believe there's um, uh, a big wooden. Um, railing or something from the uh, from the jailhouse that my grandfather kept uh, there in Graham. So, um, you know, there's and Graham's the county of, seat? Or was well, Graham it? Graham is the county seat. That's where the courthouse is. Okay. And, um, you know, they settled this fort way back uh, even before that courthouse was Oh, yeah. So, we saw the historical marker for the courthouse that they sure, had there. Yeah, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah. But, um, you know, there's a lot of history here. Um, I don't know it all, <laughs> certainly. But, um, you know, I, I invite everybody to come out and take a look at this old fort. It's been here a while. Well, there's, so. there's a lot of history. A lot of people who were stationed here went on to kind of shape uh, the the future of the nation. You know, uh, George McCle McClellan mm -hmm. uh, became uh, Secretary of War and then uh, uh, Randolph Marcy, Captain Randolph Marcy did a lot of things out of here. Blazed the uh, San Antonio to Santa Fe Trail from here and stuff like oh, that. Wow. Yeah, and this this fort has, you know, it, it, it existed from 1851 to about the Civil War and mm -hmm. uh, uh, as most of the frontier forts did, and they were abandoned for the Civil War. But uh, this one has a lot more of the um, uh, the buildings either either survived or been you know we'll say reconstructed. But uh, but several of them, like the corn house, for example, you can see a lot of the original buildings still there where they just fixed the top half of it and things like that. So yeah, most of this is all original. They've just you know kind of packed it. In, uh, yeah, right. In between the rocks here, and just so it wouldn't fall down. But uh, but yeah, my uh, my great grandfather, like I said, he came across on a um, on a mule from Georgia. He fought in the Civil War for for uh, uh, Robert E. Lee, right. and got decorated and everything. He was wounded and uh, decided to move to Texas. <laughs> and so here he came, you know, with the, the and about a year later after he got here, he went back and got his wife, brought her over. Okay, well that's how they did it then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, back but then. But about when was that? About? Oh gosh, that was like 1863. 63 Something like that yeah and the fort yeah. was uh it was uh, already here 51 yeah right. it was already established right. so that's neat so uh this is the first first place he came to when he got to young county well sure that would make uh, sense so that's, that's where settlers thing. came yeah, yeah this was all established already but, right uh, but yeah, he went out and built a rock house out there, and it's got a historical landmark on it as well. Get out. Uh, kind of sold out of the family a little bit. Um, that that uh, hurt me a little bit. <laughs> oh, I bet it did, but, yeah. But uh, it's still there, and uh, they've restored that old house, too, right on the Brazos River. They say he dug some of this Brazos River, but I don't know. <laughs> That's just an old uh, <clears throat> old farmer's tale. But, um, but yeah, it's... Uh, what was his name? His name was L.P. Brooks. Uh, L.P. Brooks. It, they called him Pink. Pink? <laughs> Pink. That's what the P stood for. Wow. <laughs> Pete Brooks. And, um, but yeah, he, and he was uh, the second camp, uh, second sheriff, sheriff of Young County. Of Young County. Yeah, yeah. So, and Young and County is very had, historical all the way around. Oh, yeah. It really is. Yeah. And then, of course, my granddad was born in that house and died in that house. Wow. Uh, and he was like 95 when he died. So, wow. Oh, so, okay. yeah, there's, uh, we hated to see that house leave the family, but, um, you know, you, there's some things you can't stop. Yeah, yeah <laughs> so, that's true. But, um, but well, yeah, I've been, uh, you know, I plan to retire here. I live in San Antonio okay. right now, but uh, in a couple of years, I'll be back uh, for good. Well, yeah. well, it's a beautiful place, a beautiful area. We were driving through it talking about how pretty this whole area is. Oh, yeah. And, and, and unlike a lot of the Texas Frontier Forts, it looks like they had a pretty good spot here. I mean, they right. had plenty of water, they had timber, they had all kinds of stuff, whereas some of them, like... Uh, I don't know, Fort Griffin and, and uh, uh, Phantom Hill didn't have much of anything. You know, right, right. Yeah, right. they've done a good job with this fort here. Yeah. yeah. Well, neat. Well, thank you very much for letting no us talk to you. you and I love hearing that kind of history <laughs> from somebody who's, who's got real history, real right. you know ancestry right. here. That's kind of neat. Yeah. And somebody who's known this fort for 60-something years. <laughs> you know? Yeah, a lot of folks have. Uh, well, it's, I'm reunions. sure it's changed a lot. It's grown up. It's, it's right. been improved and things oh, like sure. that. You they know? keep the, the uh, great grove uh, in shape there. You know, with the That's supposedly the world's largest Mustang grape <laughs> I think vine. it is, yeah. yeah a lot yeah. of folks uh, come out and have their family reunions right out there. Well, that's, uh, it, yeah. I tell you what, those picnic tables underneath the grapevine, what a neat, pleasant summer day that right. would be. Right. You know, that's really nice. Okay. <laughs>
then I had the fireworks on the Fourth of July here and all. Do that. they really? Oh yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so, well, that's neat. Well, thanks again for uh, for being on here, sure. and our kids and our grandkids will will see this, and okay. I can't guarantee anyone else will. But that's <laughs> <laughs> okay. Three, I believe. So uh, come take a look, and uh, you know it's all there. He's got some a couple of pictures here, and my grandmother and grandfather is over here as well, Lewis Brooks. the jail was built there in the county seat, uh, he would just lock up prisoners in the attic up, uh, up in his house. Uh, it was a two-story rock house that he built himself. But uh, Grandma didn't, you know, she wasn't too pleased with prisoners upstairs. So uh, she, you know, by saying that, he went ahead and built a jail uh, in downtown Grant. So <laughs> that's all I have to say about it. I mean, there was just there wasn't enough to build the buildings, and so they go into Newcastle and they got their rock back. And what they did was they ended up moving, uh, I think, eight families out of their homes. They paid them because they, they used eminent domain. That's actually federal property, and you took it without permission. Oh, so that's right. Back. Sure. Um, and so they end up getting that rock and bringing it back to the fort and building the buildings up. Well, what they realized was, oops, we got too much rock. So not to look stupid, they built a little wall around the floor. Oh. <laughs> um, but, um, That's what the CCC did. Yeah, the CCC did that in, in partnership with the county and the state. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, like downtown Newcastle was built out of um, the, the, the old feed store that's there, the, the gas station that's there. It's all built out of Fort Belknap Rock. And I know I found two of the houses that was, there's still foundation old stones that are Fort Belknap Rock. Right. And they've got the, if you look at the fireplace, you can see the chisel mark. That's a kind of a unique chisel mark. At the salt. That's how you identify the rock. Um, uh, that was Fort Belknap Rock because the, the stonemason that they had had a different way of, of cutting his stone. So um, it's easy easy to identify whenever you see those chisel marks. Period that he lived here. There's so much that's happening, and he's involved in it. Every bit of it, and um, yeah, he, he moved here when Fort Belknap was pretty much in its heyday, yeah, you know. And and uh, and you said his uh, so his house was the, was the first permanent stone structure in Young County, other than what was here at Fort Belknap. Um, and it's also about it's almost five miles due south, I think it's 15 miles down river, something like that, um, which put him at kind of out of the protection of the fort. Oh, yeah. So the fort's here, and people could live and build stuff here. They knew that the soldiers were here to protect them, but he but, rose and built his, and he was out of the protection. Now, when you say in the fort, did, did they actually, did settlers actually live within the confines of the fort? No, not, not um, now, they didn't build their structure, their homes or anything like that. There was actually a town that sprang up. But yeah, across the way. There, and that's where they lived at, but on certain instances, if there was um, a scare of an Indian attack or something like that, they would garrison that before. Yeah. Also, if weather was really bad. Yeah. So December um, December 27, 1855, when the 2nd Cavalry arrived at uh, Fort Belknap, they couldn't get into any of the barracks because the settlers were here. And that's because of Blue Northern Blue. Because of the uh, yeah. So they all kind of came in. And I, it was, it was to make the soldiers feel more comfortable, they had that family, you know, environment around them, but also to, for the settlers to feel more comfortable. You huddle up in a place and it's warmer. Yeah. Um, and of course, a lot of the people out here had never been in the Blue Northern like that. They didn't know what to expect. And yeah. so when you have a, uh, you think of the winds and stuff like that. Yeah, the wind's howling out of the north yeah. and it's and it's probably four degrees. So, so Eliza, Eliza Johnson, that was in Johnson's life. Um, you know, he was a, he's the one that brought the second cavalry out here. Um, Robert E. Lee didn't come at that time. He was doing some affairs, finishing up some affairs in Virginia. He came by boat. So when Alpha City Johnson comes, his wife's ready, she kept a diary. And that's probably the best attempt we've got of what happened during that 
and, and, and she talks about it. You know, they, they, they couldn't get into the fort um, because there were the people that lived in the town were all over here. All the barracks were full. Um, so they had to stay in a, they, they stayed in a place, she says a mile outside of the fort. Other historians have said 10 miles outside of the fort. Right. So that gives you kind of a range to go by. Um, but the descriptor that she does is she's, they're blocked by the north wind. So they've got a hill or something that has them blocked by the north wind. So that kind of narrows your geographic area. I think it's actually northeast of the fort. There's a, there was a thicket there in um, where, where, what is called Whiskey Creek today. Um, I think that's probably where they camped at. I don't think they would have gone south of the fort to the banks of the Brazos because the way she talks, she talks about the post surgeon coming out to see them to tell them what the temperature was at the fort and to make sure everything was okay. If the post surgeon came out to see them, that means that they hadn't made it to the fort yet and they're coming from the northeasterly direction coming to the fort. If they were camping at the Brazos River, they would have been able to stop at the fort and the post surgeon went and had to come out to oh, see yeah. them. So, what year was this problem? So this is 1855. This is December 27th, 1855. The Second Cavalry gets here, and then two days later, they get their orders to disperse across the state. So this is the first fort that the Second Cavalry comes to whenever they come into Texas. Um, how many How many men were in the Second Cavalry? There was about 600 that came, um, and that would include um, uh, officers, support staff, and then you also had camp followers. Yeah. These people who knew they could make money off these soldiers, right, right. you know, and um, Eliza Johnson actually talks about that in her um, diary that you had these camp followers. They would go ahead of the soldiers, and there'd be a town or a farm or something. They'd buy all the eggs and buy all the chickens and all that stuff, and then come back to the soldiers and sell all that at a marked up price. Of course. Um, and, and so Johnson actually put a stop to that. You're not going to go ahead, ahead of us anymore and buy stuff. We're going to buy when we get that. If I catch you with that, you know, there's a punishment. The, and so, anyway, um, that's kind of one of those interesting things. But not only that, she also did watercolor. She's got a book that's, that's been printed um, of all her watercolor paintings of the flora. Those are all the flowers and all that stuff. And it's probably one of the most detailed, most accurate um, early. It was probably the first one when it comes to, I guess it would have been the first one when it comes to the, the, the flora out here um, at that time. But it's been printed and it's detailed, right? I and mean, you can look at a picture and she writes what it is. She does it that scientific name mm -hmm. and what they called it and all that kind of stuff. So she was very detail oriented. They stayed, they couldn't stay at the fort. They actually pitched a tent. And the, the morning after that blue northern came in, her orderly came out to bring her coffee that morning. Well, when he got there, he had to put the coffee down because the tent flaps had crushed shut. So he breaks the tent flaps uh, loose so that they can get out. Once they get it out, he grabs the coffee to give it to her, and the coffee had frozen in the mud. Oh, so, wow. I mean, it was cold. They, uh, it was uh, the the re post surgeon's report says it's uh, negative two degrees inside the barracks. So outside the barracks, you're looking at probably negative twenty degrees because mm -hmm. it got cold. And it, which this last little winter blast that we had, um, February. February, yeah, February. That's what I the whole time I'm thinking. I mean, this is the closest it's been to what those soldiers felt whenever they were here. And how cold did it get here? Uh, I think we got to one night, it went into the negatives, only about negative three. Mm -hmm. that's how cold it was. Um, I don't know what it would have been with the wind chill. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, that wind chill was, it was, really, it was something else, though. Yeah, yeah. But then, I mean, you try to relate that, you know, just how, imagine how they did tents and stuff. Of course, yeah. they had their wool. Were they like picket tents or how, or just, or well, kind of tents? Yeah, or? no, they were. Um, most of them are wedge tents. Yeah. Um, little wedge tents. Uh, of course, officer's tent would have been bigger and everything like that. But um, uh, it wasn't until later that year that the Sibley tent was created. And uh, that's a big conical tent. That yeah, was right. Um, of course, and that was designed here. And that, that tent, uh, the Sibley tent was used, I mean, all the way into World War II. Yeah. Um, of course, and Sibley died penniless because whenever the Civil War came along, he went for the South, so they got rid of the food patent out. Sure they did. Um, but he died penniless. Would have been a millionaire. But where was he? From, where, where was that? He, General Sibley. So, um, I mean, if you read about the, the, the New Mexico campaigns during the Civil War, Sibley was in charge of the Confederacy there. And a lot of, a lot of the failure of the Confederacy in... Um, New Mexico is blamed on Sibley um, because he had a drinking problem. Of course, back then, I mean, even as a child, if you had some kind of 
bone issue or he had a spinal problem and he had a lot of pain in his back. So even at, 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 from a child's age, they were giving him alcohol to, to numb the pain. Yeah. So of course he's going to be dependent on it, but um, he, um, there were a couple of instances when they got into engagements in New Mexico that he couldn't get out of bed. Um, and so it's always said that it's because of his alcohol is in. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with medical condition too. Yeah. And we we yeah. tend not to yeah. think about that. But, yeah. um, but anyway, he designed the Sibley tent, which it looks like a teepee from a distance. It's got one pole in the middle. Right. So the conical shape. But it's got short walls. It's got it's got short. Sometimes you don't even have walls on it. Oh really? Um, it, your walls are. If you have a wall, it's a three foot wall. Right. A lot of times they would just build earthen and they oh, just yeah. put the tent on top of it. Right. Um, of course, it's you know. 18 feet in the center. Yeah, and what they would do is they yeah, and what they would do is they would sleep 14 men in those, their heads to the outside, their feet to the inside, like a uh, wagon wheel spokes. Yeah, um, and um, it's a really interesting tent. We, we've got one here for our living history days that we put up to, to kind of show that um, aspect of it. But the soldiers hated it because if you were sleeping on the opposite side of the tent from the door. And you had to go use the restroom in the middle of the night. You had to wake at least seven people up to get to the door. Because oh, you sure. had to step over. And so yeah. they, and they hated it. It was, it was a, you know, the little A-frame tent they could pack away. You know, two people staying in, in one of those. Um, but then they had, now they got this big tent. It's harder to put up. It's harder to take down. It just kind of becomes a, an issue. But Yeah. Uh, but they were real popular in a lot of places like, oh, yeah. uh, um, Fort Griffin. Uh -huh. uh, that yeah. was pretty much actually, all you ever see in any of the pictures is, is a Sibley those. tent. And actually, I think the first picture ever taken of a Sibley tent is is at Fort Griffin. That would make sense. Um, it, it's a, it, I think we use it for a lot of our that picture. We use it for a lot of our uh, uh, demonstrations and stuff when we have the Sibley up. But um, it's just one of those fascinating. In, in 1855, Sibley, while he was here, he invented it. Um, came up with it and sent the patent off, got the patent for it, and then when the Civil War came, sure. he, he went. Yeah, you talk about how he gets blamed for uh, some, you know, uh, failures, things mm -hmm. like that. I think uh, McClellan gets blamed for a lot of stuff that he didn't, he doesn't, he shouldn't be. I mean, he and Lincoln had a falling out, sure. but, uh, uh, you know, he was, he was really good with turn with with uh, tactics and oh, yeah, strategy absolutely. and all that type of stuff. He had he had the Confederates on the run many times, but his failure in Lincoln's eyes was he didn't take that opportunity to crush them. Yeah. But he was operating on uh, on poor intelligence reports mm -hmm. that were misleading yeah. about how what the troop strength was of the Confederates yeah. and stuff. I think he got a kind of a bum deal, and because his father-in-law was his chief of staff sure. at the time, I think that's why. Marcy isn't as uh, uh, well known is yeah. because he hitched his wagon to McQuillan yeah. and McQuillan got yeah. got uh, sacked in and, and, and it's, it's so, certainly unfortunate too because I mean this wouldn't we wouldn't have the frontier would look completely different yeah. if it weren't for Marcy. If it weren't for I mean he blazed uh, some of the trail from San Antonio to Santa Fe that oh, that, yeah. that, that, that that trail but he also. Uh, did all kinds of stuff, yeah. you know. They found the headwaters of the Red River and and the Canadian River and did all that kind of did thing. All the exploring up here. I mean, the, and 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 found and went out and and uh, uh, Belknap would send him out to survey and find new fort locations and stuff, you know. And uh, uh, yeah, I think like I said, Marcy. Yeah, Marcy not only was he able to blaze the trails and find those locations, but he also had a relationship with. The Native Americans around here. Right. That was very beneficial to the soldiers here. You know, when they, when they showed up out here, they thought it was going to be a certain way the way they operated. They didn't differentiate between Indians. It wasn't until they got out here that they realized that Tonkawa Indians aren't the same as Comanche Indians. Right. Uh, there's no need for us to chastise the Tonkawa Indians. Uh, yeah. They're actually helping us. Yeah. <clears throat> Which causes a huge conflict between the Comanche and the Tonkawa Indians. Yeah, but, and they wanted, but they they saw a benefit in befriending us yeah. and stuff like that with Comanche so, do you, okay, I'm going to ask you one last question. Do you subscribe to the Comanche Empire uh, ideology, that kind of thing? That, uh, you know, there, there are those who, who think the Comanches had an empire that rivaled like the, oh, I don't know, the Aztecs or the Mayans or, or the Mississippians, you know, that kind of thing. And, and they, they, uh, they ran it that way in the Comanche area. I don't, I don't, I don't think the Comanche were as civilized as that. Um, yeah. They, they were they 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 
were an economic force to be reckoned with, Absolutely. and Comanche became uh, uh, what uh, Franca Lingua for a while there. Yeah. And so, uh, my, my, what, what I say is because they were so nomadic, they hotter, they, they, yeah. they followed the buffalo and stuff. Yeah. They didn't sit down and build a physical empire. Right. Now the way they operated, but then even then with that, I mean the Comanche were not the best at negotiating with I mean, they considered everybody their enemy. Well it, it, they would negotiate and trade with you if it suited their oh, sure. if if it, their goals. So, but if that didn't work then they'd just be exactly. more than happy to attack you. Exactly. Whichever was most economically practical and at if the you, time. If, if you think, I mean, we always think with the Comanche Indians, we always think that they've been Comanche Indians for thousands of years, and that's not true. They were, I mean, the early 1700s is whenever they were introduced to the horse. Yes. And they came out of the Rocky Spaniards, Mountains. Yeah. And then that's, the, the tribe that they belonged to didn't, uh, didn't like the idea of moving out of the Rockies onto the plains and right. on a horse. Yeah. These, and they were, they were further up north, right. So then they broke off from that troop. And, and then everybody that was the Apache, the Kiowa, uh, the Wichita in this area, um, all these tribes that were here are now being pushed out by the Comanche because they become the Lord of the Plains. Yeah, yeah, um, but but they were up north and moved south yeah. and, and did that. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 I mean the, and lorded over Comancheria. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I mean, if you if you talk about the Comanche Empire, I, you know, I wouldn't put them on the level as the Mayans or anything like that. Yeah, they were definitely they did control what they had for you know 150 a territory years. Or yeah, they had a territory that they controlled for 150 years. Um, but their dependence on outside sources like the buffalo, instead of bringing them to them, they had to follow the buffalo. So they, they um, you know, the lack of domestication of animals and stuff. That's, I mean, yeah, well, and their, their nomadic nature, yeah, yeah it makes you think in yeah, not empire. And I mean, you yeah. think, you, you compare the Comanche Indians who are completely patriarchal, compare them to like Caddo and Indians who are matriarchal, where right. the women are, are kind of, it's completely, I mean, the women with Comanche Indians, the women, the women Lakotas did, and all those they're, they're the matriarchal too the, aren't they uh, yeah the, the Comanche Indians their women did all the work all the men did was hunt and take wage war and rage war yeah. um, they bring everything back sit around camp you know, um, doing whatever they wanted to do while the women had to do all the work and of course that's also the importance of having captives yeah. as your women get older you got to yeah. have younger people coming yeah, yeah, in and, so yeah. and they were big on, on that women. yeah so you know, Cynthia Parker and all that stuff uh, yeah which and she also she was here for a time for one or two days. She was here. Cynthia so Parker was here. She was here at at, at, at Fort Belly after she, after her recapture. Uh, they took her to Camp Cooper from from Pease River. They took her to Camp Cooper. They were there for a couple of days. She actually tried to escape when she was at Camp Cooper. Um, and then they brought so and the idea they're at Camp Cooper, which is west, and they're going to go to Fort Worth to re, re, um, introduce her to her civilizer. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so they leave Camp Cooper. Of course, the next stop is Fort Belknap, and it's actually here at Fort Belknap that the laundresses and some of the officers' wives actually kind of get her cleaned up and calmed down a little bit. Yeah, yeah. But I, you know, if you're if you're reading that story. Depends on how you write it. They got her cleaned up and calmed down, or did she just resign herself to, I'm not going to be able to get back to my... I mean, she tried to escape again when she was in East Texas. Well, um, no, did she resign herself to to fight from the inside kind of thing? Yeah, if I, well, if I, if I dress like this, thank you very much for sharing your story with us. Well, we're going to wrap this up here. I, I could stand here and talk to you all day because a lot of this stuff, you know, is... Fairly new to me studying yeah. that kind of thing. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, uh, I I know a lot of Texas history, mm. but I don't know a lot of uh, of uh, this frontier history yeah. as as much as I yeah. should. And and it's, it's a it's a very very fascinating history that flies in the face of conventional wisdom. I mean, the, the, it's just when you read what well, happened, it's just yeah, so difficult. You know, something that occurred to me today was <clears throat> right after the. Uh, 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 the the Mexican American War, okay, uh, which ended in around thirty no forty eight forty eight yeah. oh yeah of course uh, and uh, well uh, around that time uh, uh, I don't know why I was going to say thirty eight it ended in four, uh, uh, forty eight mm -hmm. you got California and the forty ers and mm -hmm. all that type of stuff happening and there's a whole bunch of U.S. military in Texas yeah. in 48. Yeah. 
and there, because of the Mexican American War. Yeah. Well, let's start putting some posts here. Yeah. You know, and Texas is now a state, mm -hmm. and so let's start claiming it and start protecting our settlers. And all that. one of the reasons why we started having. 40 something posts out here is because there's already a whole bunch of federal troops here. Yes. And, uh, uh, and so I thought, well, that's why, that's why this is the uh, largest department in the army. This is why one third of all U.S. Uh, military is in Texas, Texas. Yeah. is because it's right after the Mexican American War. Yeah. Well, and, and, and to add to that, so the Mexican American War is over with, part of the payment for those soldiers who are no longer enlisted, who, who've served their time, now they're out, part of that payment is land payment. Right. We've got plenty of land in Texas that we yeah, can't yeah. get rid of. And so there's, then you see, especially like here at Fort Belknap, yeah, you've got the fort here, but then you have um, soldiers, ex-soldiers, former soldiers, who now have a land pension, and they're going to come out here and settle the area. So you've, all, you've got old soldiers who are getting the land, you know, surrounding these well, forts. Well, you've got, you, you got Texas Revolution fighters who yeah. are getting land. Yeah. You've got um, uh, 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 U.S. Troops mm -hmm. who uh, fought in uh, uh, the Mexican American War mm -hmm. uh, who are getting land. Yeah. You've got uh, other people who did things for Texas who are getting mm -hmm. land, like civil servants, uh, like or, yes, and like XIT yeah. and yeah. things like that. You know, and <laughs> who got a heck of a deal yeah. by the by the way. Oh, yeah, absolutely. What a deal building the Capitol. Yeah. And uh, uh, so you know you got all that stuff. So that's also why they're. Uh, they want it settled. That's yeah. the way you claim property. Yeah. That's the way you claim uh, some other country's territory yeah. is uh, oh, is by gosh. by putting settlers there. And yeah. that's why we want a road from San Antonio to, to Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. You know, for the same reason. Which we're back to Marcy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, Who blazed that trail? The road going from here west to meet the San Antonio Santa Fe road. You know, he blazed that. The immigrant trail he did that one for yeah. anybody coming from up north so mm -hmm. and then the, the 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 military road there was a military road that went directly from here to san antonio that was right. awesome, that, that carved that path so yeah um yeah it's it's it would totally look different without marcy it yeah really it really would and he's got a garter snake named after him yeah <laughs> <laughs> i mean that's an explorer right there if you can have some species of some animal yeah. named after yeah. you you know that's crazy uh, who did that? Was that Johnson? Or somebody? Like that. You know, I mean, she's drawing all the she, you know, drawing all the plants and animals and stuff. And Should have been. Yeah, that's what I wanted. Anyway, all right, all right, we're gonna, I'm gonna quit. We're gonna, we're gonna go look at all the uh, buildings and and all the structures and everything on this on this wonderful post that so much American history has germinated or come from, and uh, uh, and without the people who were here, the things would look different. The, the whole the map of the United States might look different if it weren't for people like McClellan and, and Marcy. Forts, the federal troops were moved to the East Coast to fight in the Civil War. But that doesn't mean that was the end of this post. Confederate troops moved into it and Texas Rangers moved into it to try to help protect the settlers of this whole area, the frontier. When the, when the federal troops moved out like they did just cold turkey, you can imagine how bad it was for the settlers there, at least for a while. I mean, the, the, the Native Americans who didn't like them anyway just fell on them. It was just terrible. Uh, but the Texas Rangers and the Confederate uh, soldiers tried to come out here and, uh, and help them. Of course, the Confederate soldiers more and more were needed back east. And so there you go. Uh, you know, that, that didn't help. So lots of times the uh, settlers here would just kind of take refuge in the old fort buildings and things like that, especially in really cold weather. And things. Powder magazine.
magazine for Fort Belknap. Now, every time we go to a post, it seems like the powder magazine is the the most preserved or the 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 best looking building on, building on the post. Well, there's a reason for that. These things are have massive constructions. They have three foot walls. Uh, they are they are built to be safe so that you can keep your powder dry and yet at the same time keep someone from breaking in there and stealing it. So these are massive thick stone structures and so naturally they are the buildings that seem to survive the best on all these posts we go to. Mustang grapevine. Um, you know, we're talking you know, the you know, big. <laughs> well, I'm standing in front of the what they call corn house here at Fort Belknap. Now, it's a corn house because they had corn and other horse feed in here, and they also kept horses stabled in here they had stalls in here so this is where they kept the feed this is where they kept the horses this was this building was for the horses the neat thing about it though is it's one of the buildings that you can really see where the original stones uh start and stop when ccc came here and started rebuilding this stuff if you look at it real carefully you can see original stone you see and how it how it's mortared and how it's put together and then nice neat 20th century stone up above and it's it's very pronounced and you can see it on both sides this goes up a little bit further here you can see a line where it was original stone versus reconstruction how cool is that <laughs> 